Um, so today I'm going to be talking about tutoring EFL students in Portugal um, in the context of a writing center. So it's language education, but out of the classroom and it's parallel to the classroom. So what I would like you to keep in mind that at this point, um, this study is part of a bigger research project. And in, we are right now at the problematization phase. So all we are doing is identifying a problem. We do not have any concrete results because we do not have um, the other phases of our study concluded, okay? So let's begin. What I'm gonna do is talk about what a writing center is for those of you who don't know. And I'm gonna give you a little introduction to our writing center at the University of Lisbon. Then we're gonna talk about why we are having problems and what could be done to change it. So um, a writing center comes from the American context, okay, it's, a, it's very, very popular in North America and writing centers are also popular in Spanish speaking South America at, at English language universities where English is the medium of instruction. So there aren't that many writing centers in Europe, uh, but there are a few in Germany, if I'm not mistaken, and Ulishboa has a um, relatively new one. So what do we do at a writing center? We help students hone their English academic writing skills. And in today's globalized context, I think it's very, very important that we do that because let's face it, English has become the lingua franca of the academic world. And that's, well, important, you know, to share our findings. So at the writing center, students come and they try to improve their academic writing skills. They're mostly graduate and undergraduate students and they are tutored by their peers. Okay, so not by teachers, but just by trained peer tutors. And the main idea of the writing center is to focus on the writer, not on the text. So we make better writers, we don't make better texts. Okay, so if you make a better writer, you will automatically be creating better texts for the future. So it's all about teaching how to fish. And a writing center in theory is a place where collaborative learning takes place, okay? where writing is seen not as an end, but as a process. Okay? as a social activity in which the student and the tutor both share their knowledge and both participate to the knowledge building, uh, participate and help build the knowledge, help within the knowledge building process, sorry. And what we do at the writing center is we reject traditional hierarchies. So we try to avoid like power relationships, right? But it's not always possible to do that. Because if you consider tutor and the writer, you see that the tutor has knowledge of academic discourse and of written English, whereas the writer has knowledge of the assignment. So for example, I'm a tutor at the writing center. I study linguistics, but I still have writers coming to me and they study history. I don't know anything about history, but what I can help them with is how to write in academic English, okay? So within the writing center, we follow the most popular methodology, which is uh, minimalist tutoring. Uh, in 1991, Jeff Brooks, he wrote a landmark paper and he states that the only active agent in improving the paper should be the writer. The tutor should not make any direct changes to a text. They should avoid doing the work of the editor. So in that way, they could avoid accusations of plagiarism and that the tutor should only focus on guiding students to the writing process and use the Socratic method that is push them to find and correct any issues by themselves. So don't tell them that, hey, this is wrong and this is the right answer. You got them to see, questioning them. So what do you think is wrong with this sentence? And, you know, let them think it through, right? And, an, and so basically, an ideal tutorial would look like two peers having a conversation about writing. But once again, that is idealized. The second most important part of writing center methodology is 
distinguishing between higher order and lower order concerns. So higher order concerns are those that are related to content and organization, and lower order concerns are generally lexicogrammatical concerns, syntax level issues, things like that. So at the Writing Center, higher order concerns are prioritized and lower order concerns are avoided. So how does this work in an EFL Writing Center where students do not speak English as a first language? Well, it doesn't. At the University of Lisbon, we have a fairly Nassau Writing Center. Okay? Uh, it started off in 2017 and it's still continuing online despite the pandemic. It was formed under an informal partnership with Stony Brook University in New York, and it was very highly influenced by the US model. So what they did is they just imported this model from a um, country where English is the L1 to a country where English is a foreign language. Okay, And so what they did was they got this non-directive minimalist tutoring and this dichotomy between higher order and lower order concerns. And our tutors were trained to deal with students that came into the writing center in this manner. So just to give you an idea, we worked for seven semesters, okay? And we've only had 101 sessions with 55 students. And the majority of these 55 students were people who came back. And there's a correlation between the people who came back to the writing center and their native language being English. I don't have all the stats on that right now, but it is upcoming in our, in our further papers. But just to give you a, a small like take on what was happening in these last seven years, as, as you can see in the schedule, it has been declining because fewer and fewer people come to the writing center. And so we don't spend enough time there because we just go and nobody shows up. So what was the problem? Well, to me, as a native English speaker, it was very, very obvious okay, that this is an L1 writing center model and we have EFL writers. So my co-author in Asia and I, we decided that, okay, this is not working. How do we make it work? Because we do believe in the idea of a writing center. We do believe that it's something that students need, especially EFL students. So we started off by talking to the tutors. Okay, we did a qualitative survey. It was online, done through Microsoft Forms. Uh, we asked our tutors, uh, we divided our survey into three main parts. We asked them about their linguistic background, their English proficiency. Then we asked them about what they felt, and we asked them to rate it on a Likert scale, or what they felt about the writing center's tutoring method. And finally, we asked them to rate their work and experience at the center. In general, they all took 35 minutes to com uh, complete the survey. We had six tutors, not including um, Inej and myself, because it would be unethical to do so. Um, so we had one female, five male. Uh, the mean age was 26 years-ish. Uh, all students were master students, I forgot to add that in my slide. Um, and yeah, we had five European Portuguese L1s and one German L1 speaker. But that goes to show you that it's not only the students that are non-native speakers, it's also the tutors, because obviously we are at a Portuguese university. Although they all reported high proficiency in English, like they all said that they had at least C1 or C2 and across all competencies, that is reading, listening, writing, speaking. And they also all claimed to have learned English uh, pre-critical period. Okay. So let's talk about our results and our discussion very briefly. So all the tutors, including myself and Inej, although our, um, our results are not part of this, uh, we all reported that we complied with the tutoring model. We knew it didn't work, but we still complied. Okay, And we all had difficulties in implementing this model. There was only one tutor who reported that they frequently addressed higher order concerns, while almost everybody else reported that the, the, the students that came to us, their English proficiency was just not that high. So we could not prioritize higher order concerns. In fact, most of us would say that we would prioritize syntax level issues. So they had the vocabulary, including the academic vocabulary, but not the syntax, because for example, in Portuguese, 
you make really long sentences and in English you don't in academic writing. So we would get like people who had really long sentences that to me as an English speaker just did not make any sense, but I couldn't make direct changes to a text, you see. So what that made us like basically conclude and discuss and talk about was that the higher the frequency of these lower level issues, the more incomprehensible the writer's text was, obviously, right? And at this point, at an EFL writing center, where at a university where English is not the medium of instruction, okay, addressing lower order concerns just automatically becomes more relevant. Okay? Like tutors are frequently conf confronted with lower order concerns, but they also don't have any training to address these. And finally, from the student's perspective, their knowledge of the English language is very limited. So they do not have the autonomy to correct their own mistakes. So how can we apply the Socratic method when the person does not have the background knowledge to apply, right, and to correct their own mistakes and to be autonomous? So. For us at the University of Lisbon, with the way it stands right now, the Socratic method and the prioritizing of higher order concerns and the non-prioritization of lower order concerns is just not working. Okay? And in fact, what I, what we believe, my co-author and I, is that it hinders learning opportunities. It also makes the EFL tutor's task harder to accomplish because you feel like you're working with your hands tied behind your back. So what comes next? Well, we are hoping to devise an appropriate methodology based on the L1 of the general student body, okay? wherein the medium of instruction of the university is also taken into account. We also hope that we could have a methodology that accounts for the psych psychological well-being of the tutor and in this manner prevent feelings of frustration or guilt and make their job, their volunteer your job as an EFL tutor at a writing center, a memorable experience, an enriching experience as opposed to that filled with guilt and frustration. And finally, we want to ensure that there's a, a definite line between what a tutor does in the writing center and that they do not play the role of a language teacher, which they are not, they're not trained to do and we could not expect them to do it. So our future work, will consider the student writer's experience. That is what we are currently working on. Um, then we are also trying to develop similar strategies for linguistically diverse academic contexts. Like what happens at a university where there's not just one L1? You know, what happens in like multicultural contexts where like multilingualism is the key. That's where our world is headed. So we have to think about these things now. And finally, uh, we would like to consider the pedagogical implications not only in the EFL classroom but also in academia as a whole and the society at large because if you empower young people to partake in academia you will see the ripple effects throughout society. So these are my selected references um, and thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions I'm here. Thank you so much, Sidel. Uh, please, if you have any questions, raise your hand. And also, please give my regards to Professor Mata, if you still uh, work with her, OK? Oh, I am not in Lisbon anymore. I'm at Oxford now, uh, so I probably okay. won't see her. Julia, please. Yeah. Hiya. Can you hear me? Hi. Perfect. Um, I was wondering if in their approaches they use learning from existing academic texts and how that would perhaps help with addressing both the grammatical, the general language deficits, but also the issue of not only using a Socratic method, as you called it, but also actually providing them with direct examples of academic writing so yes i i have thought about this too but it comes down to since it's outside the classroom plagiarism okay so the minute you tell someone that okay this is the way you should do it or i think this word would be better than this word 
like English teachers don't like that. You know, it, it automatically comes down to, oh, you were telling them what to write. And it's a very, very fine line. And it's very, very hard to navigate around. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it honestly leads to a lot of guilt in, in the tutor because either you break the rule and you help them or you keep the rule and you can see that some, you, you let someone just do the wrong thing. Sure, I understand that approach. Uh, what I meant was that when you teach them how to structure it in the first place mm -hmm. or what choice of words to use, etc., uh, whether the approach of reading existing academic texts and them figuring out themselves what they could you know, use in relation, which then doesn't have to be the exact same sentence, but you get a feel for the structure, you get a feel for the choice of words, you learn a little bit more about appropriate vocabulary and grammar and so on. Um, whether yes. that could be, you know, um, that could basically solve, not solve that problem, but be one way to mitigate that problem of not telling them directly, no, 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 write this instead. Exactly, definitely. Like that's what I do personally in my tutoring mm -hmm. sessions. Uh, I give people an example of my essay, you know, like the ones I got graded really highly on. I'm like, this is what I do. Maybe you could follow this model and like, you know, take what you need from here and then give them access to resources like APA and OWL and things like that. But they're, you're only there for one hour and usually a student takes like about 45 minutes. Okay, so there's only so much you can do because they bring their texts in. And sometimes it's just like, where do I even start? You know, yeah, like, should I tell them that they need to go back to English class? Or should I try and dive into this text? So it, it's very complicated, but that, that methodology, like what you just um, said, it works really well in an English classroom. And if I was giving a class that was about academic writing, yes, definitely. Uh, but I feel like it's really hard for feedback for like follow up in this method because it's voluntarily, uh, it's a volunteer thing, right? They come in when they want and maybe you're not there this time and the next time they come with somebody else. So there's no real, you know, like there's no continuity. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. I, at least I make resources available. <laughs> okay, thank you, very interesting. Um, then I have one more question. I think now do we still have time? Yes, yes, we have four minutes, of course. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, I have a similar point like what Julia made, just, you know, brainstorming. And maybe you'll yeah, like yeah. one idea or, yeah. Um, so it seems to me that one issue seems is the different proficiency levels of the students. So obviously the, the English model assumes mm -hmm very high proficiency, whereas your students are not all there. No, um, not so maybe one thing to start with would be to give them like a very fast proficiency test. Like sometimes um, teachers use vocabulary test as a proxy for a proficiency test. Okay, I'm actually writing that down, thank you. That's okay, I'll email you afterwards, okay. Um, so that is one approach, just to, to gauge very fast, like in 10 minutes, yeah. the person's proficiency in a very rough way. And then you can see, oh, does it make sense for me to just talk about global skills? Or should I direct them to resources that will help them improve their proficiency level? Because that, that is like the grammatical errors have to do proficiency. Definitely. Um, and what many teachers do that can save you some time is basically they give codes for errors. So if they mm -hmm. see an error, they say this is a grammatical error or this is, I don't know, a punctuation error, etc. And then you let the student figure it out. <laughs> like, what is wrong with wrong. this sentence? <laughs> you know, and that kind of frees some time for you. And the other thing that can be done that will make your work more efficient could be that gradually you can build some online resources. Yeah, that's what uh, we're working on. Yeah, so that you know each student can be directed to different resources and then you won't have to do on a one-to-one -one basis, you know, these things, you know, you won't have to replicate it. Most definitely, but with respect to what you said about correcting errors and like, you know, 
giving them codes. We can't do that because we're not teachers. So uh, it's like completely like, no, no doing that. <laughs> Oh. You know, like they come to you and then you tell them like, oh, but maybe you can restructure this sentence and then they'll struggle for five minutes and then you'll sit there and like, oh my God, I should just tell them the answer. Yeah, you know? it really has to do with what happens in your university, really. I mean, uh, I've talked to people like in my university. Yeah, as long as the text is understandable, the lecturers are not expected to, to you know, penalize students for... Uh, language errors and the same happens in other universities in Europe as well so it could be that you know some errors as long as the text is understandable are acceptable so I, I think agree. you have to kind of explain that to the students like what level is acceptable sometimes we get texts that just don't make any sense but if I think about that same text in Portuguese I think like oh how would I say the sentence in Portuguese makes perfect sense but in English I would I would just never say that you know and that happens a lot but I personally don't know about other um, faculties like other degrees but in linguistics that would be penalized if your text didn't make any sense on a like you know grammatical level people be like i don't understand this sorry zero <laughs> okay I'm just, thank you. i'm exaggerating maybe not zero maybe like nine or something mm. 